Hey everybody, uh, great to be with you for class number 11. It's, can you imagine it's, uh, it's our last class? It's our last class. It's incredible to think that we have been walking together, learning the Bible, and just being encouraged. So thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, thank you for your passion for God. And my prayer is that you are different and changed from what we have read together here in Romans. So tonight we're going to overview Romans chapter 6, and then next week we're going to do a review of the final, and then the following week, the 15th, will be the final, okay? So you can certainly take it any time after the review, or if you want to take it on the day of the 15th, it's up to you. Uh, Just as a reminder, um, I issued a quiz uh, to your emails. Uh, I'd like to receive them by next week. And then also I'm waiting for the essay on justification and in context to Romans chapter five. Awesome. Okay, Lord, we just commit this time to you asking for your words to come and be our words today that you would transform our hearts and our minds. And thank you for your word that sets us free in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Okay. All right, let's look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 here. So a a big part of this class is we're going to talk about a term called co-crucifixion, co-burial, and co-resurrection. Okay. And we're going to identify what it means to deny yourself because I, I think this is an um, a misunderstood concept that um, can be initiated by willpower and can be initiated in the strength of the flesh it can be initiated uh, based in human effort now we do have a will And our will is very powerful, our will to choose, choose life, choose death, choose Christ, choose myself, choose victory, choose defeat. Everything is a choice, everything. So our will needs to be fortified with the Bible. Our will responds to our belief system. So let me ask you today, what do you believe? So a lot of people might have a generic or general understanding of what they believe, but you're in Bible college, so your answer should be specific. Your belief system either strengthens your will or it weakens it. Now, recently in another class, I shared about ignorance is a disrespect for the divine. Ignorance is so much more than just not knowing. That's certainly part of it. But disrespecting the divine means I do not value the things of God. And this this happens in our life, and we should be aware of it so that we do not become complacent. That word complacent is that we are acceptable or we've accepted the status quo I'm comfortable with the uncomfortable, and we're satisfied with not growing. And uh, that is a shocking revelation that you read through the book of Jude, how the church in the first three verses allowed false teachers to come in unnoticed. And they made a huge mess because the church was asleep. All right, so I just went on a whole thought there. So I'll, I want to park that for right now. Our will, your will, our will. We need to have the word of God hidden in our heart so that we might not sin against God. God has given us a free will to choose. That's why we are not robots. We are not uh, cloned or uh, following aimlessly or blindly. So when you read Romans chapter 6, you see a very natural struggle. And remember, the struggle is not sin. I want to emphasize that. The struggle in our life 
is not sin. It's acting out. It's acting out the struggle that either is glorifying God or it is disrespecting or blaspheming God. So sin in our life, missing the mark or being consumed with my own way, my own will, <clears throat> these will reap corrup corruption. You sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you reap life. So my will, your will. So in temptation, in challenges, what we believe is what we will do. People might say, I was born this way. Uh, this is my genetic predisposition, like we've said in previous classes, that what I'm predisposed to doesn't, mean, doesn't need to be my predetermination, which means just because I'm wired doesn't mean I have to uh, let that be my destiny. In our family, alcohol was a huge problem, and God delivered my, my parents from that when they got saved. So in my blood, I have a predisposition because of the fall, because of um, decisions that were passed down to alcohol. Maybe you have a predisposition. Maybe you're pre predisposed to worry, predisposed to lust, predisposed to um, drink, um, maybe to steal or lie. Our, our old sin nature is wired to sin. And this is why he says in the first verse here, Romans chapter 6, that grace is not something that allows us to live in sin and not bear the consequence. What shall we then say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, we said earlier in chapter 5 that grace abounds, grace superabounds, grace is absolutely triumphant over sin. But if we choose to sin, if we choose to reject the provision of God, then what happens? We live in the consequence of sin in Romans 6, 23. Now, there will be grace for the consequence, but the consequence still will come to pass. Now, in his mercy, God removes what we deserve. Yes, and grace gives us what we don't deserve. But if we're going to tempt God and choose sin, then God may use the sin to correct our thinking and correct our way of life. So if I'm going to drink alcohol, get in a car and crash into somebody and kill somebody, then I have to bear that consequence, God forbid. And that's a tragedy that God never intended to have happen, but he allows it because of our will. You know, God allows a lot of things because he's a gentleman he's our savior he will not force anything upon you he says if you want that lifestyle then you will bear the consequence of that lifestyle in my love i've warned you in my love i've sent people to you in my grace i have provided a way of escape but if you keep going at this then the consequence will be another gracious way to turn you around. It's amazing how stubborn our will can be. Comparatively, if we choose life, if we choose faith, if we choose love, if we learn and choose grace, then there's a great, a totally different um, impact in, in fruit. Like coming to church, choosing to come to church when I don't feel like it, what happens? We're quickened in Romans 8, 11. We are encouraged in 2 Corinthians 4 1 we are loved in John 13 1 we are we are hearing a word and learning the will of God in Colossians 1 9 and uh, we are accountable uh, it, we're, we're accountable and gathering even more as the day approaches in Hebrews chapter 10 so our will so again we may hear this from people that don't understand grace oh Grace is, if I'm, I have to be careful with grace because grace will give me a license to sin. We don't need a license. We are wired to sin because of the fall, unfortunately. So grace can be cheapened by thinking it's a get out of jail free card. Okay. Or it's, it's, I'm, God is somehow winking at my sin, right? 
God does not relate to us based on our sin, right? Because he couldn't. But he certainly has knowledge because he's everywhere present and all-knowing. But he chooses to look beyond our sin and see our need in Romans 8, 13. We are, we are loved and our sin is remembered no more as far as him relating to us. So how he deals with us in Psalm 103, 12. So this is important to understand that grace is that creative agent, the person of God that is benevolently showing us goodness and saying, hey, listen, choose the way of life. Choose me. Choose a way that will profit you and prosper you in, in 3 John 2, according to the Spirit. All right. Certainly not. We do not use grace as a license, right? How shall we who have died to sin live any longer to it? Or do you know that as many of us has been baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through the baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also could walk in the newness of life. All right, so I want to kind of read on here in a minute, but I want to just say the two points that today we're going to talk about being dead to sin and alive to God. How does that happen? Dead to sin and alive to God. It seems like in seasons in our life, sin is raging or there's tendencies that we gravitate to without any type of resistance. Why is that? Well, if we live a casual Christianity or a complacent Christianity where we're just familiar or just kind of sloppy in our faith, then we're very vulnerable to sin. Sin will be very attractive. Uh, sin will be something that uh, we'll be drawn to. Our kryptonite, you know, it's good to know what your kryptonite is. Just like Superman, he had all this ability and strength, but one thing weakened him. And we should be aware of what that is and commit it to God and stay away from it uh, and choose in our will not to play with it. Just like playing with fire. A fire is beautiful, but if it's in the wrong place, it's very destructive. If we play with fire, we will be burned. If we flirt with sin, if we hang around places that our flesh is raging about, then we potentially could sin and cause a lot of trouble. All right, so how is it that we are dead to sin and alive to God? Let me read on here. <clears throat> because verse, chapter 6, verse 4 is God's plan for you and I. And I want to get back to this walking in the newness of life. But before I can really talk about that, I want to read on. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, okay, that's a big, okay, united together, okay, this is what's what I want to refer to and our ministry has referred to over the years as co-death, co-burial, and co-resurrection, which means that when Christ died, he died with you and I on, our, on his mind. When Christ died, he died with our sin on his back. When he died, our provision for death was opened up so that we could put on Christ and live in the freedom of righteousness. Let me show you this verse to help us as we <clears throat> understand this principle. Ephesians 4, 24 says it well. And that you, okay, let's read 23, um, okay, 20 actually. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, that's the key. That you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So putting on the new man, which is created unto righteousness. How does this happen? Well, Romans chapter 6 shows us that just how Christ died, we surrender. Okay, we surrender. We say, okay, Lord, I agree with why you died for my sins. I agree for the penalty of sin. I agree that you have a way that is greater than my old nature. 
and I'm going to put on, I'm going to choose to live in a new nature uh, based in true holiness and righteousness. It's a choice. It's a choice. Some people say, well, I don't have a choice. Uh, maybe a drug addict might say, I'm just, I'm just led to my sin every time. Well, get help, get accountability, get together with stronger believers and identify the two reasons why we sin. Okay. We sin. I mean, generally we sin because we have an old sin nature, but we practice sin because we're believing a lie and we, uh, we have a reason for a coping mechanism. Okay. So let's say someone says, I do what I do because I don't feel worthy. I don't feel loved. I don't believe that God will answer my prayer. I don't believe that God really cares about me. I believe that if people really knew who I was, they'd want nothing to do with me. I really believe that my, my greatest needs will never be met. Those are all lies. Identify the lie in your life. Identify the belief system, the flawed belief system. Then fortify yourself in truth. Put on the new man. What is the new man saying? Okay, you are a saint. You are a believer. You're in, a believer in particular. You are one that is greatly beloved of God. You have the grace identity which declares who you are in Christ. <clears throat> this fortification of the will will kick in when there's temptation and confrontation and cosmic invitation. It's like, oh, come on in, just come on in. No, because it's impossible to prepare in the trial or in the temptation or in the invitation or in the opposition. We have to do it before. So this is why hiding the word in your heart, which means not only meditating on it, not only thinking about it, not only practicing about it, but agreeing, saying, God, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I'm going to build my life around the truth of, of it. So many of us can get mixed up with feelings. Oh, I don't feel loved or I don't feel like Christ is really alive in my life. I don't feel saved. We, we really have to identify this word feeling emotions emote, which means they respond to the truth at hand. So if you're if you or I are embracing a lie, it's going to respond to the lie with a reaction of a coping mechanism or a self-defense mechanism where <laughs> when we <laughs> excuse me, when we are believing truth, our emotions are healthy. We're responding to absolute objectivity. And it is casting out the liar. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's look on here. So let's consider this. So we are united together. Another good verse is Psalm 8611. Lord, it's a great prayer. Psalm 8611. Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. But what a great, what a great prayer. Like in you know, in temptation, Lord, unite my heart to fear you, unite my heart to embrace your truth. Even though my flesh in Psalm 119, 25 is gravitating to lust or power mongering or lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and the pride of life in First John chapter 2, the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5 uh, can step in and say, you are walking in the Spirit and therefore my Holy Spirit will guard you. So number one, we are putting on Christ and walking in the spirit before we enter into the place of temptation, uh, because we might as well prepare our hearts now in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, putting on the armor now, deciding now to think with God, deciding to, um, to have that shield of faith, that sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the loins girded in truth, right? The feet shod with the gospel, praying always. These are our provisions. If we don't put the armor on, then we go to battle and we become, we, if wounds are in, inflict us and we become casualties very quick. Many Christians are like, they have a squirt gun and no armor going into battle every day. No, 
we get on our knees and we, we call out to God and we say, Lord, fill me today. Lord, I want to put on your nature. I want to think about what you say, not what people say. I want to really have an identity that reflects grace. So how does this happen? Well, we see it here. Uh, so in the likeness of his death, again, when he died, our old man died. When he was crucified on the cross, the provision for cruci being crucified with Christ is the provision to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies in Galatians 2.20. And I want to read 2.20 and 6.14 in a minute. Okay. Knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that a body of sin might be done away with. And in this, this is not saying that we will not sin. This is not saying that we're going to live in sin eradication. It means that um, we are not sinless, but we will sin less. Okay, a little play on words there. And uh, by the way, if nothing is going on in my heart, then my mind is empty and we will gravitate to our lusts and they will never satisfy. They'll, they'll only stimulate, but leave you more hungry. This is why it's a vicious cycle. So let's say our past, there's something in our past. We can't change our past, but people try to, they analyze their past. They, their past dominates their present. Why? Because it's not been crucified with Christ. It's not been nailed to the cross. It's not been buried. It's not been put under the ground and it's not been done away with. We, we try to mess with it because God has pro given us newness of life or resurrection life. So we have the cross. We can live on the front end of the cross and we can struggle and have our sin and, and live in this whole battle, or we can agree and surrender and die with Christ and say, Lord, it's no longer I that live, but you that live within me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me in Galatians 2.20. Very important. I'm crucified. I have said, Lord, it's today, it's you. Today, my flesh is not going to be in the driver's seat. And if it does, if there's sin, if there's bad mistakes, we recover. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is. Repentance is a gift of grace. So I'm not going to say don't try to sin because you're going to sin worse. But I'm going to say put on the new man and God will change your appetite. He'll change your mind. He'll renew your mind. And you'll gravitate and desire and want things that will actually make you whole and satisfied and refreshed in your spirit. So people, people tell me all the time, and, and I, when we all can experience this, we, we battle. We're battling. Oh, we're battling. And, and life is so hard. And there's a lot of sighing and a lot of, you know. And, and I'm not minimizing the struggle. But if we're alive, then it's a struggle. But if we're dead, there's no struggle. Have you gone into the graveyard and, and um, found a, a, you know, somebody struggling in the graveyard? No, they're dead. Their bones are in the ground. You cannot offend a dead man. You cannot, um, you cannot lie to a dead man. You cannot provoke a dead man. So being crucified with Christ means that I have agreed with what he has done and then i've not only agreed with it i've surrendered to it and that's a that's a big difference so i can be a talking head or i can literally say i'm going to act as though it's true it's going to be my belief system i'm embracing it by faith therefore i'm going to live in the power of the word so one side of the cross is my approach the, the other side of the cross is newness of life, resurrection life, resurrection joy, resurrection love, resurrection grace, resurrection peace, resurrection joy. And it's not something we have to like try to make happen. We just simply die. Now, and, I, and I'm speaking of that um, spiritually, okay? So how is it that it's done away with? We should no longer be slaves to sin. And this is, this is a real issue. We, we are led by sin that's our that's our nature we can involuntarily cave to sin because we just get tired and god is saying you're not dead you're not nailed on the cross with me you're not buried with me 
Let me take that struggle. Now, there are uh, thorns in our flesh that are designed, as Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 8 and 9, that he asked God to remove. But he said in verse 9 that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, and the beautiful thing about the grace of God is things may not change immediately, but God will add what you need to know him. So in the struggle, in the process of maturity, uh, in, in Romans chapter 5, 4, four and 5, uh, we see that in this maturity process, we are learning Christ, okay? So I want to stress that our objective here is not to sin, to be sinless, like to, to have a sin eradicated. But the point is, I don't want to be domineered or I don't want sin to have dominion in my life. So we do have a fleshly nature that just simply needs to be crucified with Christ moment by moment every day. Okay, I'm upset. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I'm jealous. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, I'm envious. Please forgive me. And then with that repentance, there's a turn of mind, a turn of heart. But the real question is, what lie is it? Or what reason? Why am I doing what I'm doing? These are two important things to identify and to then have them removed and replace them with the mind of Christ, the word of God. Okay. So this is an, an intentional moment by moment thing. We're no longer slaves for sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Right? Hebrews 10.10, 10, his sacrifice was perfect. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So God says, I've dealt with the sin issue. I've dealt not only with the sin issue, but with the death issue. He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves, that's the big word, to yield yourselves, to surrender, to not necessarily be a bean counter. Oh, I can't believe I sinned in this place again. I can't believe it. No, no, no. It's like, when we ask for forgiveness, God forgives us brand new. His mercies are new every day and sin is removed. Okay. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how does this happen? All right. Galatians 2.20, we have read uh, or, or quoted, but let's look at Galatians 6.14. Galatians 6.14. Now, we are not fighting the devil. We are no match. We're not even fighting our sin because our we're wired to to want our sin, right? What are we doing? The good fight of faith means that we are surrendering and we are allowing the the power of God to to defend and to um, fight our battles. Okay, so. When you read verses like, um, uh, let me, we, we, uh, Luke 9, 23, to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, otherwise you're not my disciple. That word deny means that uh, we, are, we are yielding the power from us to God. And we're saying, um, we're saying, no, Lord, uh, I mean, no to myself and yes to the Lord. Okay, it's like dieting. Okay, let's let's put dieting for for any. If you are starving yourself or um, you are denying yourself in dieting by willpower, then what's going to happen? Well, most likely there'll be a moment where you crash and you eat that cake or you eat that ice cream. Right? This is not what I'm talking about. It means that. To yield or to reckon means to recognize, hey, listen, God, I cannot do this without your power. I cannot do this without the word of God being submitted to the word of God, submit to God, and he resists the devil. So the effort, the emphasis is yielding, surrendering, recognizing my need for God and embracing the truth that we are empty, we are hopeless, helpless, and we're without power in Ephesians 2, 1. We were dead in our sins when Christ died for us, okay? 
So no, notice this here in Ephesians. Uh, is that the verse I wanted you to look at? Um, I'm sorry, Galatians. Yes, Ephesians, Philippians. Okay, Galatians, Ephesians. That's what Galatians 6.14. So let's say you wake up in the morning, you put clothes on, right? You clean yourself up, but of course you're not going to walk out with no clothes on. It's the same principle. How many Christians walk into their day without being spiritually clothed? It's We have to put on Christ. We have to say, Lord, I'm going to focus and value and receive and apply your truth so that when the devil, not if, but when the devil comes, when I have the emotional mutiny going on, the truth is there to guard. Our, in Proverbs 4.23, our heart is guarded and we are ready and not caught by surprise. And this is why if and when we fail, we are quickly getting up. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again. But the, the carnal man stays down and, and enters into mischief, right? All right, Galatians 6.14. So I want to stress this. Like if we try not to sin in willpower, the, our, the strength of sin is in the law. So we will sin. But the point is, Lord, I want to yield to myself today. Lord, I want to reckon myself and say, I did die with you. I did, I am buried with you. My old life is gone, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old things are passed away. And today I'm resurrected in a new life with God. Every moment there's resurrection life, power, truth, joy, grace, resurrected mind, resurrected feet, resurrected hands, resurrected thought patterns. My belief system has got to be grace-oriented and truth-centered. All right, Galatians 6.14, here it is. It says, um, okay, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So we're glorying in the work of Christ. Okay, so what does it mean to deny yourself and take up your cross? It means that we're glorying in the work of the cross. We're glorying in what Christ did. We're lifting it up. We're focusing on it. It is our concentration. It is our confession. It is our belief system. And in that practice of glorying in the cross, we are detached from the desire to sin. We're detached from our old life. We are detached from the predisposition to sin okay so where does sin have its power our sin has power in any uncrucified part of my heart where does sin have power in any place where i have not given it to god it's in any place that i've entertained uh something other than glorying in the cross now this doesn't mean that we have to live like a monk and like you know, in this strange ascetic way. No, it means that every day I'm preparing my heart, my mind to think with God and to celebrate the work of the cross, the work of redemption. In Colossians chapter 2, it's in 14 through 17, he nailed everything that was contrary against us to his cross. That means your, your past, your present, is nailed to the cross and your future is resurrection life right now is resurrection life all right let's look at so let's look at uh, galatians 5 11, same principle here and brethren i preach circumcision why do i suffer persecution is that the verse i want galatians 5 11, yes and i brethren i still preach circumcision why do i still suffer persecution then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying that, like, if I reject the provision of the cross, then I will also reject my prepared victory. Okay? All right, this is, let's look at Colossians 2.20. Colossians 2.20, look at this. So instead of fighting, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to lust today. I don't want to worry today. I don't want to live in anxiety. No, no. Just, just say, okay, Lord, that's my predisposition, but I'm going to proactively respond 
to your grace today, your peace, your truth. I want to have a promise that my heart is feeding on. You, you know what? You know what the issue is? Is a starving heart. A starving heart. Nothing that's going on in my my heart. That's complacency. I'm just satisfied with the old. People that have been walking with God many years, they're just satisfied with past victories. No, I need fresh manna every day. I need, I need a full heart that's going to address my mind. If my mind is reflecting an empty heart, then we're going to go towards the thrill of the chase and we're going to look for what stimulates us. And it'll leave us hungry every time. Colossians 2.20, notice this. I'm using a different Bible tonight, so I'm kind of like looking around here. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you not subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concerning which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Okay, so what is he saying? He says, <laughs> he says, if you're, um, if you're died with Christ to the basic principles, then your taste, touch, and want is going to be a whole lot different. You're not going to lust after that woman. You're not going to desire that place of power. You're not going to desire approbation and, and control. And you're, you, the anxiety will turn into a place of peace where we understand that God is greater and God is in control. All right. This is such a great principle that it takes a lifetime to learn, by the way. Okay. All right, let's turn back to Romans chapter 6 together. Romans chapter 6. So we are dead to sin, verse 2, verse 11 and 12. We know that how do we die to sin? We simply take away its value. We, we just say, you know what, Lord, we reckon ourselves. Uh, remember, the struggle is not sin. We could want something. We can identify something. Um but we don't have to act on it, right? We don't have to act on it. So uh, we put on the new man before there is a reason, right? And we identify the lie. You say, okay, devil, John 8, 44, you're not going to lie to me today. I'm not going to believe your lie. All right. And then confess truth, right? Confess, embrace truth. Because that is the real reality. Okay, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. So we become a prisoner. We become hostage when we, when we just say, you know what? It's no use. Um, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. Um, when we give in, again, we lose a piece of ourself every single time. It's like a person that has premarital sex. They give themselves, or even postmarital sex to other partners. They give themselves, they give their soul over to other people until there's nothing left to give. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Present yourselves to God and be alive from the dead. There it is, Romans 12, verse 1. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. There it is. How are we dead to sin and alive to God? Right here. What do we submit to? What is it that we avail ourselves to? Do I submit myself to the projections and lies and feelings? Or do I say, no, that's how I feel, but that's not the fact of the, of the finished work. What is the fact of the finished work? Is that that God never changes. We change like the weather, but God never changes. So what does an all-knowing, all-present, almighty, unchanging God saying? That is what I want to grab a hold of. And this takes effort. This takes, in, this takes intention where we have to grab a hold of truth intentionally. It just doesn't happen, right? We have to choose it. And that's why you're opening your Bible. That's why you're here tonight. And you're reading and learning and loving God with me. All right. So, and do not present, yield, submit your members as instruments of righteousness to sin. Because that's what the devil wants. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Now, see, the devil's coming, John 10, 10, to kill, rob, and destroy. He wants to kill your capacity. He wants to rob your joy. And he wants to kill, rob, and destroy your, your future. Okay, but be alive to God. Be alive from the dead. It's as if we were dead with Christ. And then all of a sudden, as Jesus was in the grave for three days, the breath of God raised him up 
and death and hell, nothing could could um, prevent that. Okay. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Okay, what is he saying? You will not live in the power of sin. Why? Because it's not you living anymore. It's Christ living in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh is by the faith of the Son of God. You know, I get the I get the battle, I get the struggle. I mean, I get the 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 going back and forth, the mental gymnastics, the whatever it is. The struggle is real because we are still alive. We're still alive. And this is where we have to say, God, crucify, I surrender my hands today, my mind, my eyes. Job 31. I make a covenant with my eyes that I might not look on a maid. We surrender the right to our opinion and to our privilege. And we say, no, I could sin, but instead I'm going to honor God. And this is a daily thing. And this is when we enter into freedom, freedom with God in verse chapter 6, verse 10, for the death that he died, he died for sin once and for all, that the life that he lives he lives to God. We are free. We are free from addiction, free from destructive thought patterns. We are free. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we're, we're slaves to righteousness. We say, thank you, God. I am yours today. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Uh, let's read 1 Corinthians 6, 19. That's a, I, I want to quote that correctly. Uh, so if you're fighting a sin today, uh, surrender to God. In surrendering to God and learning his mind about that sin. That's important too. What does God say about my sin? I want that to I want that to be I want to learn how to fear the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord makes us clean. So in the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Unite my heart to fear your name. I just gave it to you earlier, Psalm 86, 11. So God will change our thinking, change our appetite, change our mindset because we're united, yoked up focusing on something perfect and that's christ so 619 618 flee sexual immorality every sin that a man does is outside the body okay outside the body but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body or do you not know that the body is the temple of the holy spirit which is in you who is in you the spirit is in you whom you have from god and you're not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Great verse there. I'm not my own. You know, a world today is like live like you want. You want happiness, you want love, then just do whatever feels right. Love and practice whatever means or whatever um, universal sin, you know, just this whole lasciviousness. God says, you're a slave. You're a slave if you do that. You are submitting to something so much less than what I have prepared for you. I just want to encourage you tonight. Let's turn back to Romans 6 and we'll close here. Um, what a provision we have and what freedom we have. God has called us to triumph or lead us in his triumph. Oh, this is so good. What then, verse 15, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Okay, again, our relationship with God is based in a new covenant. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that through, though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you have been delivered. Okay, there it is. Okay, we were all slaves, but now we're obeying doctrine. Now we're obeying, presenting ourselves. We're learning faith, and we're, we're not, our life is not our own. We're not seeking anything that is glorifying ourselves, but we're glorying in the cross that is the wisdom of God. This is so edifying. This is so edifying. So uh, verse 15 through 23, 
we really understand the value of being a slave to righteousness, a prisoner to the Lord, right? It's incredible. And having been set free, verse 18, from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And, and that's a thing about sin, isn't it? it? It doesn't stay small. You know, you add sin to sin in Isaiah 30, verse 1, and it just grows, and it takes over, and it becomes a cancer in our life. So he is saying, reckon yourself dead, present yourself, say, Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering today. And what newness you're going to have, what life you're going to have, what power you're going to have, uh, because it's no longer you living anymore. My personality, my charisma, my plans, my, my dreams, all that. It's Christ leading us. Okay, verse 21, clo 20, closing. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things of which you were now ashamed? Okay, so we had freedom to do what we did, but there was always shame attached to it. Proverbs 10, 22, when God adds, he adds no sorrow. That's why we seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and then he adds to us what we're supposed to have. For the end of those things is death, but now having been set free from sin and having been slaves of God, you have the fruit of, of holiness and to the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Let, let's just every day start off with God. And when the onslaught happens, no weapon formed against you will stand. Why? Isaiah 57, 15. Why? Because you are surrender to God, you're listening to God, you're, let's say you fall, there's a quick recovery, and all of a sudden you're back thinking with God. And, and what happens is you're learning Christ, you're learning truth, and you're also not naive to the devil's tactics. Okay, Romans chapter 6. God bless you.